The Federal Ministry of Health and Social Welfare has clarified that there is no evidence of the strain of the newly detected COVID variant XEC in Nigeria. The assurance comes as the variant first reported in Australia spreads to 29 countries, raising alarms over its heightened virulence. In a press release issued on Saturday, the Ministry's Deputy Director of Information and Public Relations, Alababa Logun, the Ministry addressed circulating inform misinformation about the supposed resurgence of COVID-19 in the country. The Ministry emphasized that the public should remain calm, adhere to universal health precautions, and rely on verified information from official sources. To mitigate potential risks, the federal government has ramped up its preparedness across federal tertiary hospitals and border entry points. Joining us now is Dr. Alero Ann Roberts, an associate professor of community health with the College of Medicine, University of Lagos, and an honorary consultant to the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, LUS. Good morning, Dr. Robert. Always good to have you on the That's show. Enough. Thank you, and thank you for yeah, having me back you. again. Thank you. Well, doctor, when the Nigerian authorities say uh, the COVID XEC has not been detected in Nigeria, something that, uh, that is, uh, you know, ravaging 29 countries of the world. Now, we're told that uh, it's a very more serious uh, strain of uh, COVID-19. Should we believe them? Yes, we should, actually. Okay. If, <laughs> if we believe them, what do we need to know? That's because the we were important. here. There was no, uh, uh, what, was it Ebola? Until yeah. somebody brought it. That's exactly and then what's going to happen. Everybody again. was caught. Uh, That's napping. exactly what's going to happen again. But this time, we will not be caught napping because we are on alert. And that's why that letter went out, uh, I think it was on Friday last week, it went out, yeah. uh, putting us all on high alert that this is happening. It only takes for one person to bring it in or a plane load of people because we are entering the Christmas season. Children, mm -hmm. friends and relatives are coming in for the holidays. Let's face it, uh, our lovely economy has made us a, a prime destination for those abroad to come to. So we are expecting an influx of people to come into the country. And the chances are if they are coming from Australia or any of the other 29 countries or any European country, there's a very high possibility they could come in with the XCC variant of COVID. So we've all been put on high alert. We are getting training again to remind us of what the symptoms are, what we need to do. But so far, the way we're looking at it, the evidence has shown that number one, the symptoms are not vastly different from any of the other COVID symptoms. So the case of what do we need to know as man on the street, woman in the home, what do we need to know is the universal precautions. All right, please, if you may tell uh, our viewers, what does, because some people had resolved that COVID had gone, only to wake up and hear that uh, COVID has come back, uh, has returned in a more vicious form. Well, that's well, the well, truth of the matter. <laughs> we need to be reminded about In fact, the precautions. I was, having a, I was having a discussion with a member of my household this morning, and he says, but Ma, I thought COVID has gone. <laughs> COVID never went away. That's just the truth of the fact. COVID never went away. And the, the problem is that because we did not suffer it as violently as the more high-income countries did, people just assume that A, it's a non-issue, B, it has gone, nobody has it. See, we have far more serious problems to, to worry about. But COVID never went away. And what we are seeing is that there have been, and we talked about this, if you remember, I remember sitting here talking about this. There have been a series of mutations over the, since COVID first made its appearance, December 2019. There have been a series of mutations, and this is yet another mutation. What makes this one interesting is that it's what we call a double mutation. It's a combination of two variants. And the danger is that that double mutation, does that mean there's a possibility of double severity, double seriousness of disease? These are things we are sort of holding on, holding our breath, waiting to see. But as of now, and don't forget that despite everything that has happened, the health sector has managed to maintain a high index of, uh, of uh, propriety and uh, uh, efficiency with all these ongoing diseases, emerging infectious diseases. So we have been looking out. We have maintained our biosecurity processes. We are working, and you see, I, I tell people, this is the important thing about public health. When public health is working, 
you don't know anything about it. You don't see anything, you don't hear anything. We are there quietly working in the background. Only when there's an alert, such as what we have seen now, that the federal ministry says, hey, be on the lookout. If you have a resurgence of cases, particularly as we're going into the holiday season, be on the lookout. That's when you now know that, oh, there could be a problem. Okay, so let me ask you, you said that we are better prepared this time, but some people might beg to differ. You know, and I, I would like you to please share in detail how better prepared we are, at least to assuage the fears of Nigerians. I say this because in terms of information and public awareness, public health, so that's the area of public health, public awareness, how better are we prepared than we were during when COVID first came, COVID-19? The second is infrastructure. If you read uh, Dr. Chikwe's book, which he recently um, released about his time um, at the NCDC and managing COVID, COVID-19, he said that he was disappointed that a lot of the structures they put in place were not maintained. So it means that we're going to have to almost start from scratch, as it were. I don't know if that's the case. But he did mention that we have a big challenge of maintenance, of cultural maintenance in this country. So how better prepared are we this time? You know, because we should have learned from mistakes from the past so that even if we hear of news like this, we are not too shaken because we know that the government has, has it under control. But I'd like you to share with us, how, how better prepared are we this time? You're asking me a very controversial question. And this is a con an, an argument I have with my clinical colleagues all the time. I'm public health, yeah. so I'm out in the community. So better prepared in terms of exactly what we're doing now, sharing information, okay. making everybody aware. And the important thing to the public is what do they need to do? What do I need to do as a member of the public to protect me and myself and my family from serious disease? Yeah. What do I need to do? And that's information we will share. And it's the usual. Mask up in crowded places, hand washing. So masks are back? Oh, well, yes. Mask up in private, okay. in, in public places never went away. Yeah. Yeah, well, Never went yeah. away. Don't say masks are back. They because reduced you get, the number of people, people that were stopped. doing it. Yes. Yeah. People stopped doesn't mean that it went away. It doesn't mean that we ever dropped that rule. Okay. If you're going into a public place, an overcrowded place, you want to protect yourself and your family. You don't want to. There are certain places I do not go mm. because I'm exposed in a hospital environment and I know that mm, there's a ch I don't want to carry a disease into a, into a party, for example. Yeah. So that's my, you know, but these are the things that we have to be out. Hand washing. Yes. People stopped washing hands. Yes, true. Nothing, nothing should stop us washing hands ever. Mm. The COVID should have taught us for life. Mm. And this is what you're saying about we, we don't have a maintenance culture. Mm. As a people, we do not have a maintenance culture. That, unfortunately, is an ethnographic fact. We must develop a maintenance culture. And it starts with us. It starts with every time you go home, as soon as you walk into your house, wash your hands. Mm. It's a habit we need to just develop. With soap, not soap, just water. Just soap and running water. You are right, sir. Yeah. With soap and running water. And the public places that had washing well, hand facilities, need to, they yes, are, many need of them to are have no that, there. Yes, yeah. they need to have it. And we need to, okay. from schools, from everywhere, yeah. you know, these are, this, this is the maintenance culture we're talking about. So when Dr. Chikwe said yes, when we are talking about the maintenance culture in hospitals and health facilities, yeah. if we don't have a maintenance culture, you're not going to maintain it. You're not going to magically get it in the hospitals and health facilities when we as a people have refused to develop it for ourselves. Yeah. Very true. So would you say max mandates? You know, there's a difference between just a little mask up and a mandate for masking up. Would you say mask mandate back? Yeah, I know washing of hands here yeah, very important. Also, would you say it's time for us to be able to stock up on vaccines and give people booster doses at this point in time? And uh, would you also say it's best to be able to be on alert for contact tracing again? Can I start from back to front? Yeah. Be on alert for contact tracing, definitely. We are, that is what that letter was all about, so yeah. we need to be on that. So we are going to have that, those protocols in place. They, we have them in place because we have them in place for diphtheria, we have them in place for Lassa fever and all the other ongoing epidemics we are still facing, including cholera. Oh, yeah. So it's merely a switch because all we need to change or all we need to look at is the symptoms that are coming in. But that's for the uh, healthcare professionals. Mask mandates, I am not in favor of because I don't like masks. Okay. But that does not mean that if I'm going into a crowded place or I've got symptoms or somebody else has symptoms, I will not wear a mask. I will wear a mask. That has been my life 
as a medical professional anyway. So it's something that you just you just do. But, but mandate, not a mandate. I, it will be very difficult to mandate. It didn't okay. it didn't really work. And what happened was that people put the mask and then put it under their chin. Of no use. I will use the same mask for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. No use. So, but Stuck protecting yeah. yourself, yeah. yes. Stocking up on vaccines is a very, in fact, that was the question I was thinking about shortly before we came on air, and I thought, hmm, if, if Mr. Governor calls me and says, Dr. Robert, should we stock up on vaccines? Very difficult question to answer because the vaccine we're talking about, the COVID vaccine, changes every six to nine months. As the new variants come out, we're changing the vaccine. So the cost of stocking a vaccine with a very limited shelf life, very limited acceptability, very limited uptake. Would money not be better spent elsewhere? That's the cost-benefit analysis. I shall leave it to the economists to answer that so, question. So I'm not the, a health so, so economist. Then, then what do we do if we, we don't stock up on vaccine to, to be able to reduce the, you know, how virulent the strain is? If somebody picks it up, for instance, you pick it up, how do we reduce that if we don't vaccinate? Vaccination is not the only way to reduce it. That's what, what we're what trying other to say. Way? Let's start with reducing transmissibility, transmission. Okay, apart the, from transmissibility. We have to in, reduce... In a worst case scenario where you get it, what should you do? In a worst case scenario, vaccine won't even help you. It's too yeah, late. It's too late. But we, yes. So if somebody so what, gets it, yes. what do we do? Go to the hospital. Okay. So if you have symptoms that are worrisome, and several people have called me over the weekend with worrisome symptoms, and were very disconcerted when I said, are you sure it's not COVID? Go and do a test. Okay. And then somebody else calls me back and says, which of the two tests should I do? Which means that they had gone to do the test, which is important. So you have worrisome symptoms, you have cough, you have a chest, a nasal congestion, any of the symptoms you know, relating to what we call the upper respiratory tract, from neck to about here. You know, nasal congestion, runny nose, cough, sore throat, difficulty. The problem is always going to be difficulty in breathing. Once there's difficulty in breathing, please, Go rush to the nearest, to rush to the hospital. We are about border control. We have because, started you know, those in ones. many of these West African countries, they used to have very strict surveillance, yeah. you know, at the borders, at the checkpoints. But, you know, some of the countries just said, we're coming, no need, no need for COVID certificate. What should the Nigerian authorities do? We never stop. Don't forget that every time you travel and you come yeah, back you into the country, the you still have to fill, fill up the forms, a surveillance yeah. form. So, surveillance so form, we've yeah. never stopped stop that. that. A lot of people that. don't fill the form, get to the airport and argue. Yes, people but that doesn't mean, because that's the thing about human behavior. Yeah. You can put all the protocols in place. If people choose not to obey. No, the authorities are very lax about yeah. this. Since the officials also believe that COVID uh, had disappeared. Well, and unfortunately now with that letter, if you are lax about it and any case comes in, we will now examine which border post did it come through, who was on duty at the time it came through, and what did you do or not do. So there are going to be consequences. Should we then, stock up on oxygen tanks? I hope we didn't stop stocking up on oxygen tanks. Are you sure those infrastructures still uh, they, work? They better be in place. With the gurneys I have, and, on, I have, on all the I have centers. a case right now. Do you we, saw me coming in and do I'm... We, are we sure that... All the gardens, the isolation centers, we all the oxygen we, we infrastructure, all of those things are working. We are we sure of that? We will not need all those things because the truth of the matter is that so far, the evidence has not shown that we developed a serious, you know, a, a, we, a, cases as serious as what we saw in the Western world. <laughs> the, in, the, in, in terms of numbers, now you have to think in terms of numbers. Because if we had the numbers that overwhelmed what we had, then we had a very serious situation. But we never really had the numbers that overwhelmed. We had the fear that cases would overwhelm our facilities, but it somehow petered out. We it, don't know. We still don't know why. Many, many of those facilities, so-called isolation <laughs> centers, they've been converted into venues for uh, Uwambe parties. And on we lost the staff, yeah, sir. We lost the staff. You cannot have, everybody says no bed space, no bed space. Yeah. You forget that bed space is reliant on nursing care yeah. and Ooh. other health. Yes. The Jaffa syndrome. Yes. Jaffa. We lost, I wanted to we just lost ask that. quick about dirty December because the big concern, we have a lot of people who are returning home. 
We have many concerts yeah. in December, and so it's it's a red flag for a lot of people. Which is why that letter went Good. out. So is, are there any extra precautions? Would you discourage people from going out to large gatherings? Because we have people who are coming, traveling from different parts of the world, coming to Nigeria, and we talked about some of the how porous the borders can be. So what can we do internally? Because that's something of concern. We can go back to the ABC, what I call the hand washing, mask up and avoiding crowded places as much as possible. Okay. I will say one thing though, because whether we like it or not, healthcare right now is extremely expensive. True. And you do not want to add that cost to the cost of new clothes, to the cost of turkey and chicken, and the cost of food and all that. Please let us be very, very cautious <coughs> to get your health insurance in place. Yes, you hear it, heard it here, morning show, Arise News TV. Make sure you have health insurance and everybody around you is covered with health insurance because you can be covered with health insurance. The last thing you need is a member of your household staff calling you that his or her mother is sick in hospital and you will have to put hand in pocket to assist. So make sure that well, everybody has uh, health it's insurance. So bad in Nigeria, many people don't believe in health insurance. Ah, you better they, believe they in it now. They think God will take care of then everything. You will see God take care of it and, now. Uh, they will rather <laughs> go to their pastor uh, and pray for them. That is true. But <laughs> it's going to be very, very useless when you have a serious case. God forbid it takes only one serious case to tip several families into poverty. Well, it's just cheaper note, to get health insurance. On that note, we'd like to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roberts, for this uh, public enlightenment opportunity.